So um, on behalf of the Norman Lane Jr. Memorial Project, I want to welcome you all to today's conference, uh, Anatomy of a War Experience, Vietnam 1967-68, Tet and the Turning Point. And before I make any further comments, I want to recognize my collaborator, Dan Moore, who's known to more of you than I am, probably. Uh, Dan and I have been working on this uh, as an idea for uh, longer than I'd like to think. Um, but once again, I want to recognize Dan for his efforts in this. And he'll be making some comments in a couple of minutes. Um, I just wanted to give a few background slides, and then Dan's going to take over, and then I'll come back to introduce Lieutenant General Labuti uh, prior to his comments, and there'll be some general comments as well. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the sponsors of this uh, conference very generously. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick M. W. Smith from Memphis, Mr. Leslie M. Baker, Jr. from Winston-Salem, Mr. Lester G. Ruffant from Washington, D.C., and Mr. C. Boyden Gray from Washington, D.C. And also one donor in behalf of the OCS Class 41 and TBS Class 367 in honor of our fallen OCS and TBS classmates and their families. I also want to acknowledge the support of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities as well as the Marine Corps Heritage Foundation. And I also want to acknowledge Connie MacArthur and Chris Williamson of my office uh, in Winston-Salem for their invaluable help and contributions to the success of this effort. I want to also recognize some special guests who have honored us today with their presence. And I'd like to ask, if you're able, if you could please just stand when your name is called. Um, first of all, Colonel Wesley Fox, retired from the United States Marine Corps. Colonel Fox is the honored recipient of the Medal of Honor uh, for actions uh, when he was company commander with Alpha Company 19 Marines in the Oshel Valley in February of 1969. Colonel Robert H. Thompson, USMC, retired. <laughs> Colonel Thompson, well known for his actions leading um, the 1st Battalion of the 5th Marines in Hue during the Tet Offensive in latter February and early March, for which he was awarded the Navy Cross. Thirdly, Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Paul retired from the United States Marine Corps. Jerry in the back there. Jerry did a tour in 1965-1966 as a platoon commander with 1st Force Recon. Uh, he became known to me, though, because after his tour, he came back to Quantico and in the fall and spring of 1966-67, he was a platoon commander with Foxtrot 2 platoon of TBS Class 367, of which Norman Lane Jr. was one of the classmates of, one of, the, of many of the TBS 367 guys here. So Jerry, thank you for guiding Norman through those uh, challenging times. I also want to acknowledge uh, four enlisted uh, personnel, Marines and Navy, First of all, R.J. Del Vecchio, who is a combat photographer with the 1st Marine Division. And Corman John Doc Nunn, who was working with Kilo Company, to the best of my understanding, over 1967, 1968 in Vietnam. Doc is seated. Oh, somewhere. Okay. Uh, Corman Tony Malazzo, who worked with Doc Nunn in Kilo Company over the same time frame, late 67 68. <laughs> and last but not least, my good friend Corporal Alan Weird, who was a machine gunner and squad leader with 1st Platoon Kilo Company over the same time frame, November 67 to August of 68. As well as a very close friend of Norman Lane Jr.'s in country and at home. Uh, these four photographs uh, show what a fun time it was in Vietnam, I guess. And I'll just tell you that all four of these gentlemen are here in the audience, so the first person to associate the photograph with the individual here, there's a prize waiting for you, okay? <laughs> I want to also acknowledge four aerial observers who I didn't know about in time to make the slide, but I recently became aware of, had dinner with some of them last night, who were, three of them were Army bird dog pilots with the cat killers, 
the 220th Reconnaissance Aircraft Company, but they supported the 3rd Marine Division. So they're very familiar with the infantry units and other units within, for example, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines in that same time frame. And they are Rick Johnson, <laughs> Ray Carroll, Bob LaFerriere, and then the fourth gentleman is um, Bob Laramie. Bob was a Marine with the 1st Marine Division, so he was the backseater uh, as an aerial observer with an Army pilot. So, Bob. Okay. So, I'm just going to say a couple things. Number one, at the time of the Tet Offensive, I was 15 years old. I was a sophomore in high school. And the town where I was in high school in the early 1968 was a place called Brownsville, Tennessee, with a population of about 7,000. It's in West Tennessee, about an hour east of Memphis, right off of Interstate 40. It's the same high school that four years before, a grocery store clerk named Alan Weird had graduated. It's the same high school where two years before, a Vanderbilt University graduate named Norman Lane Jr. had actually come to teach French and sophomore English. It's also the same high school at which an Eagle Scout named Rick Johnston would graduate that May or June of 1968. So as you see in the slide, just a little bit of biographical uh, or demographic information to in indicate in 1960 and 1970 how small the county of Haywood County is. And Brownsville, as I said, is about 7,000 population. It's almost equally distributed between African American and white um, citizens, and uh, actually a little bit more tilted toward African American population in 1960. Over 1965 to 1970, 13 young Haywood County men died in Vietnam over a period of four years and nine months exactly. Six of them were African American, seven of them were white. And so what I've got here is a map of Vietnam from 1967, I believe it is. And I just want to emphasize the names, the dates, and the provinces in which all 13 of these men lost their lives. And I just want to focus on the beginning and the end. Uh, Platoon Sergeant William A. Farrell was lost in the ambush at Landing Zone Albany at, during the Battle of the Yadrang Valley, November 17, 1965. He was 38 years old. He's actually mentioned in the outstanding book that Hal Moore and Joe Galloway wrote on We Were Soldiers Once and Young. He was from the town of Stanton, Tennessee, which is also within Haywood County. And his death was the first from the county in Vietnam. The last was Rick Johnston, August 17, 1970. Rick Johnston's the same Rick Johnston who had just graduated as an Eagle Scout from Haywood High School in 1968. And it's uh, interesting to me to look at the figures. Not only were the casualties almost equally distributed between African American and white, uh, they were almost equally distributed between Army soldiers and Marines. And actually, by the time Rick Johnston had graduated in May or June of 1968, about half of those 13 young men had already been lost in Vietnam. I want to point to two in particular. First of all, Norman Lane Jr., who was killed in a mortar attack at Camlo Hill on March 29 of 68. But also I want to talk a little bit about 19-year-old Private Billy Wright, who was a combat medic with the 1st Cavalry Division. And he was lost, actually, on the second day, according to however you start the Tet Offensive, of the Tet Offensive in Crangtree City, where the 1st Cavalry Division was based at that time. And uh, about 20 years ago, just in terms of background, a young history PhD student from the Netherlands decided to come to Haywood County and do his dissertation on Haywood County as a small southern community and the effect and impact that the Vietnam War had on that community. And I'm going to quote a little bit from his book here. And this goes back to the date of Sunday, June the 2nd, 1968 in a report that was published in the local weekly newspaper, The State's Graphic. Memorial services honoring soldiers of six wars were planned at the Stanton Cemetery for Sunday, June the 2nd, according to the May 31st, 1968 issue. 
the parents of Billy Wright, who had been killed in Vietnam on February 1, were presented with two awards, the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star Medal with the V device. Owen Burgess, who was then editor of the State's Graphic and had himself been a B-17 crewman and POW during World War II, added a personal note to the service, to the award ceremony for Billy Wright, in his editorial column, which I will quote in full here, because it sheds some light on feelings about the Vietnam War in Haywood County at the time. Quoting Mr. Burgess, old memories flooded back almost to tears when the colonel read the orders of commendation. His display of personal bravery and devotion to duty. We refer, of course, to the award ceremony when Private Billy L. Wright was honored posthumously at the home of his parents who live in Stanton. Our memories went back to Hiram C. Scogmo of Milwaukee, Wade Hampton Sneed of Georgia, and Wyatt C. Cloud of rural Texas, and many, many more comrades and friends of the 390th Bomb Group whose families surely experienced similar ceremonies a quarter of a century ago. Back then, we had a cause. Now Billy and the thousands of others who will not return from Southern Asia have only an intangible uncertainty as to why they were there. They only knew that their country called, they went, they died, they are honored. The small bits of ribbon and the bronze medals are left. That and the memories. So in my last slide, I just want to state that in January of 2014, the nonprofit dedicated to the memory of Norman Lane Jr began the process of remembering not only Norman Lane, but the countless others who served our country in a very difficult time. And in concluding, they only knew that their country called, they went, they died, they are honored. The small bits of ribbon and the bronze medals are left, that and the memories. And with your help, their memories shall endure unto the end. Thank you. Good morning. War and Memory. A Vietnamese American scholar of the Vietnam War has recently written, all wars are fought twice. The first time on the battlefield, the second time in memory. Today you'll hear from presenters who will recall their own combat experiences nearly 50 years after they returned home or waited for someone to return home from Vietnam. To provide some context to the theme of this conference, we present a brief timeline of the months leading up to the 1968 Tet Offensive and the months immediately following the battle. July 1967. Although the tactical situation in South Vietnam is a stalemate, communist fighters, the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, and the National Liberation Front, also called the Viet Cong or the VC, have taken significant battlefield losses. To change the dynamic, the Communist Party in the North, which coordinates military operations in the South, prepares for the general offensive and general uprising. A coordinated attack on South Vietnamese cities and provincial headquarters designed to rally support for the overthrow of the South Vietnam government. The North Vietnam Communist Party assigns primary responsibility for carrying this out to the NLF rather than the North Vietnamese Army. Although the NVA will play a dominant role in the siege of Khe Sanh and the occupation of Hue. U.S. intelligence reports important meetings are being held in Hanoi. The Johnson administration concludes that the communists are seeking a negotiated peace settlement out of necessity. Since spring 67, the administration has pursued a public relations campaign, the success offensive, to maintain support for the war effort. In a news conference, President Johnson says the Vietnam War is on track, but more troops are needed. The Secretary of State adds, the, the enemy is hurting very badly, but it's still a tough, long job ahead. August 67. 
an NLF internal document describes a new mission that will lead to a turning point in the war. Quote, the time is right for violent military moves. The NVA continues an extended effort to neutralize the Marine base at Kantian and tie down Marine forces near the DMZ. The U.S. Army Chief of Staff announces the smell of success in the war. September 67. The NLF plans for the occupation of Hue. In North Vietnam, over 200 Communist Party officials are arrested, a faction not supportive of the general offensive and general uprising. U.S. print media reports that the consensus on Vietnam war policy is beginning to erode in Congress. November 67. North Vietnamese troops mount large unit attacks in I Corps, II Corps, and III Corps. A communist document captured near Dak Tho states the weeks-long battle there is a feint to divert U.S. forces away from the populated lowland areas to the remote mountainous areas and to improve the techniques of large-scale coordinated attacks. U.S. forces capture another document ordering the Tet Offensive to include attacks on cities and a takeover of Saigon. The date of the attacks is not mentioned. The Johnson Success Offensive peaks. Westmoreland tells Congress that the U.S. phase-out in Vietnam can begin within two years if favorable trends continue. Westmoreland tells Congress that the U.S. phase-out in Vietnam can begin within two years. The address to the National Press Club, Westmoreland states, the war in Vietnam is entering a final phase when the war begins to come into view, the end of the war. Westmoreland and Ambassador Bunker together convey the same message in a Meet the Press program. The success of offensive works to the extent that public support for the war increases in the U.S. over the short term but it makes the psychological and political impact of the upcoming Tet attacks more severe. December 67. In a speech, Ho Chi Minh calls for the increased efforts to win the war. He publishes, publishes a Tet poem alluding to a decisive battle. The NLF recons targets in Saigon. The JCF chairman says, we are winning the war, but it's possible the communists may try a last desperate effort to turn the tide, similar to the World War II Battle of the Bulge. Westmoreland cables Washington that the communists will attempt a countrywide effort to win the war. January 68. Communist troops, primarily VC main force units, move within striking distance of their targets. Way and Case on are exceptions. In Way, most of the fighters will be NVA Army units, at Case on exclusively NVA. On 27 January, the Communists declare a seven day ceasefire during Tet. <coughs> Ambassador Bunker and Westmoreland cable that the Communists may violate the Tet truce. Westmoreland orders an immediate redeployment of troops from border areas to positions closer to Saigon. He remains, however, focused foremost on the NVA siege of Quezon. Tet is celebrated in North Vietnam on 29 January, a day earlier than South Vietnam. On 30 January, NLF NVA attacks begin in two cities in I Corps and five cities in II Corps. 31 January 68. After midnight, simultaneous, simultaneous attacks begin and five of the six largest cities of South Vietnam, including Saigon, the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, 36 provincial capitals, 64 district capitals, and dozens of bases and military installations. The U.S. news media spotlights these Tet battles with special broadcasts on national TV networks. February 68. Nearly all Tet attacks are quickly repulsed by U.S. and South Vietnamese troops. 
After initial success in Hue, North Vietnamese troops start to withdraw on 24 February. In the battle, 220 U.S. troops are killed, 400 South Vietnamese troops, an estimated 5,000 North Vietnamese in NLF, and as many as 6,000 civilians. 40% of the buildings are destroyed. The NLF in a captured report states successes were limited. An NLF communique describes Tet as a good start, but further efforts are required for victory. Days after Tet begins, President Johnson tells the press that the Tet Offensive is a total failure, but the administration begins to defend its war policy. In the wake of the Tet attacks, a Harris poll reports renewed public support for the war. But a Gallup poll soon afterwards reports 50% of the public disapproves of the president's handling of the war. 35% approves, 15% undecided. Influential TV journalist Walter Cronkite visits Way and comments in a broadcast that the war is a bloody stalemate with no end in sight. The February Tet Offensive across South Vietnam leaves 1,500 U.S. troops killed in action, 2,800 South Vietnamese troops, an estimated 45,000 NVA and NLF fighters, and 14,000 civilians. These are all estimates. March 68, North Vietnamese troops begin to withdraw from Khe Sanh. A U.S. military contingency plan to raise troop levels by more than 200,000 is published in the New York Times, causing a public outcry. A 20 March Gallup poll reports a new wave of public pessimism over the war. On 22 March, the President announces the replacement of Westmoreland. A 25 March Harris poll reports that 60 percent of the public believes the Tet Offensive was either a standoff or a defeat for the U.S. cause in Vietnam. A 30 March Gallup poll shows 63% of the U.S. public disapproving of the President's handling of the Vietnam War. On 31 March, the President announces he will not run for re-election. In May and August, communist offensives are limited to unsuccessful attacks on well-defended bases. By mid-68, Allied forces are on the offensive throughout South Vietnam, but lose ground in pacification efforts in the countryside and lose confidence among South Vietnamese who had moved to the cities for protection. While Tet is a crushing military setback for communist forces, and the NLF is virtually decimated as a fighting force for an extended period, the Johnson administration concludes there is a limit to the continued escalation of the war. Plans for a gradual reduction of U.S. forces, Viet Vietnamization of the conflict, and a search for a negotiated peace began. Most of us in the field during Tet could not see the big picture, the larger perspective of what was going on in Vietnam. We received our information from Armed Forces Radio, the Stars and Stripes newspaper, and what we learned from briefings and hearsay from our units. Looking at three of my own letters home during Tet, two written from south of Hue early in February 68, I write on 4 February, for the past week we have not been fighting a guerrilla war but a conventional one. The NVA could be launching the offensive for two reasons. Either they actually believe they can defeat us in conventional warfare, or they are trying to tie us down in the South for a push across the DMZ. Many of us seem to think the reason for the offensive is so the communists will have a bargaining element. They are looking for a battlefield success. On 6 February, I write, the communist offensive is ebbing. They could have assaulted Quezon and our bases along the DMZ. Still, the entire 1st Marine Division is tied down to the point where if a communist drive threatened our positions near the DMZ, I doubt whether Marines could come to their aid. I doubt the communists believe they can win a military victory. 
And finally, on 13 February, the day I arrived in Hue, the battlefield, the battle for the city is not over or anywhere near completion. My battalion, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, has lost a great many Marines, including junior officers. Hotel company today was without an officer. The company gunnery sergeant was leading the company. Foxtrot company has had one officer killed, one, wound, one wounded. My old company, Golf, has lost two wounded lieutenants. From my optic, the Tet Offensive was a surprise, even a shock, that the enemy could muster such a wide demonstration of coordinated force. I had believed or wanted to believe that we had been winning the war. Now I wasn't sure. At the time, I thought I was living through a critical period in the Vietnam conflict. Thank you.